Setting up Google Cloud Platform is a breeze. You have a variety of options that we'll go through in here. Before we get started, let's talk about signing up for Google Cloud Platform. Google Cloud Platform is a public cloud, so nearly anyone with a credit card can sign up and begin using services pretty easily. You should note that a credit card isn't actually required to initially sign up. However, continued use does require one. But that raises an important point. Google Cloud Platform usage may incur billing. From time to time, Google Cloud Platform offers a free tier of usage and or credits for new users. These offers change, so you should check on the latest availability available on Google Cloud Platform's website. These credits or free tiers do come with limits. Sometimes a certain amount of use per month is allowed of a certain type, or sometimes a certain dollar amount is just credited to your account when you sign up, and you're free to use it on any variety of services until it's exhausted. Regardless, outside of these limits, whatever they may be, or if these free tiers are not available, usage will most certainly result in charges. We'll go over how to look at what charges are available and maybe even set up some alerts to ensure costs don't get out of hand. Make sure you know what you're using and have the authorization to bill a credit card before going any further. Let's walk through signing up for Google Cloud Platform. Let's start our Google Cloud Platform adventure on, ironically, Google. Let's search for Google Cloud Sign Up, since the URL might change after we publish this course. I think it's a safe bet to say that on Google's own search, you're probably going to get either an ad or one of the first results will be the right one. Let's choose the Google Cloud Platform free tier. A free extended trial, $300 free credit and always free seems to be the offer right now. Your mileage may vary based on the time and click the try it free or sign up button. If you have an existing Gmail account, feel free to use that. You can also click create account if you don't have a Gmail or you'd like to create something separate. Whatever email that you use, make sure that you have access to it. It's going to be important because you'll have to verify it later and you'll receive important notifications at that email address. If you chose to sign in with an existing Gmail account, no worries, you won't have to go through this process if you've already verified a phone number. You may be presented to verify a phone number or your email address if your existing Google account doesn't have those verifications in place. Whether you created a new account or are using an existing one, once you've completed these verifications, check your email and your text messages, and you'll be able to access the Google Cloud dashboard with the username and password you just established. Now that we've signed up for Google Cloud Platform, we have a variety of options to access the tools available to us. First and most ubiquitous, the GCP dashboard is available in any web browser. This includes an innovative cloud shell that we mentioned earlier, an interactive command line interface that handles the installation of software and access to the command line software all through your web browser on a remote machine that Google runs and hosts for you transparently at no charge or at least no additional charge to the resources you already have running. This is one of my favorite ways of accessing my resources in Google Cloud Platform, as any web browser and any machine in the world with simply accessing and logging into my account, I have access to a powerful command line interface. iOS and Android native applications are also available on their respective platforms as app stores. The features and functions available in these native applications may vary. They're typically a subset of what's available on the web browser and using the Cloud Shell Interactive CLI. However, notifications and other native-first application features are available in these that you may find useful in addition to using the web browser and command line shells. Finally, Google offers the Cloud Shell Command Line Toolkit, very similar and exactly the same code as what is provided in the Cloud Shell Interactive CLI for installation on your machine, your server, or other local hardware. This is actually the exact same code as provided in the Cloud Shell. 
simply delivered through a different mechanism. Let's return to the web browser that we use to sign up for Google Cloud. If you don't have it, don't worry. Open a new web browser and go to console.cloud.google.com and log in with the credentials that you created. Once you've finished your sign up, you should be greeted by a screen similar to this. If you've lost or closed the web browser, you can get back to this point by going to console.cloud.google.com and signing in with the username and password that you used. Let's take a tour of the dashboard. You can click Tour Console and Google will walk you through the important parts of the console. Let's do that. A quick five minute walkthrough will guide you through the high level concepts of resources, projects, and activity logs, searching, and how to get support. Feel free to walk through the console tour and resume this tutorial when it's complete. For now, we'll click Cancel Tutorial. We'll see you back here if you choose to go through the console tour on your own. One of the important central features of Google Cloud Platform is the project. On the top bar, you'll notice my first project is already created for you. By clicking on this, you are able to see or create additional projects. Projects are logically separate entities which group together Cloud Platform resources. They also allow you to consolidate billing for one set of resources against a certain account. It's recommended that you use projects to separate things which are, well, separate projects. This allows you to do accounting, billing, and access control in a consolidated way for things that should stay together and things that should stay separate. Throughout this course, we'll just use the My First Project that was created automatically by Google. You'll notice it has a name, which is a relatively human-friendly name, and it has an ID. This ID is used across Google services when you're referencing the project to create resources or search resources or connect to resources in. It's this ID that is used, not the human friendly name. By accessing the products and services menu in the upper left hand corner, you're able to look at specific items within Google Cloud. Let's click home. This is typically where you'll end up when you log in from now on. It gives you an overview of the project information and it'll give you an overview of the estimated charges for the month. This is a convenient way to make sure that you don't have anything running that's accruing charges that you may not be aware of or that you don't actually want to use. It also gives you some information about usage. This is customizable. We'll go into that a little bit later. In the left-hand menu, you can see access to a variety of categories. Google's Compute Services, Storage services, network services, Stack Driver, which is their monitoring, logging, and tracing offering, and other ancillary tools, and their big data and machine learning offerings. We'll go through each one of these in a lecture later in the course. For now, just know that this left hand bar is your primary means of accessing these services. You can also use the search function to search for a given tool, such as Compute. Searching from Compute allows us to add a VM instance, a shortcut to an actual action, a view of looking at our current instances, or Compute Engine, which is the family of actions for VMs. One important thing that we should go over is identity and access management. We've created our account here. Our account allows us full access to everything within our Google Platform account and our projects that we create. We can allow other people, members of our team, etc., to access our project as well. We also may want to create accounts for eventual use for service machines, for automation, if some process needs to access certain resources in our account. All of that is done through what's called IAM and admin. IAM stands for Identity Access Management. We'll go through this in depth later in the course, but for now, just know that your login that you're logged in with right now 
are the keys to your kingdom. Keep them secure, and sharing them with anyone you don't fully trust is probably not a good idea. Instead, using IAM and admin, you're able to create and invite other users to your account to collaborate with you and to share on certain terms that you can define. This allows you to create them an account that defines what they can and can't do. It also allows you to create a service account. A service account is an account that may be used by a process or an application which allows it only certain access. So even if those security keys are compromised, only limited information or billing information is compromised and the amount of damage that could be done with that leak is minimized based on the permissions that you've assigned that account. Let's look at IAM. Using IAM, we're able to invite people to collaborate on our project. Remember, we're inviting them to our project, not to our whole account. By clicking Add, we're able to add new members. In this case, well, I'm going to add myself at a different email address. I can choose a role. I can make them a project administrator, editor, owner, or any other number of services, and I can only let them access those services. In this case, I'll make it so that I can access this project's compute engine resources only. If I click Save, an email has been sent to that email address and logging in with that account will now only allow me administrative access to compute resources within my project. This is a very useful tool for small and large teams alike and removes the risk in having to share login or billing information. Another important area to look at before we get started is the billing area. You noticed on the home page we were told how much we were overall spending. At this point it was zero. By clicking on the billing tab in the navigation menu, we're able to access a detailed breakdown of what our bill is and where we're spending our money. In this case we can also go to budgets and alerts and set up a variety of spending alerts. Let's create a budget to help us avoid a surprise. Let's call our budget test budget. It'll be connected to my first project. And any time it goes over $10, including a credit, we'll make sure that it sends us an alert. Let's click Save. And now, any time that our budget is exceeded and we hit 50, 90, and 100% of our budget, we'll be notified. This is a great way to make sure that you're not spending too much on a given project or you're not spending too much on a given billing account. These alerts can be more complicated as you set up more rules, and we'll get into that, and you can consult the documentation as you need. Let's examine a unique feature to Google Cloud, the Cloud Shell. In lieu of having to install software on your local computer, Google provides you with the ability to access a robust command line interface directly through the web browser. The way this works is a cloud container is created on a system that Google manages at no additional cost to you. This cloud container allows you to access the cloud Google Cloud Shell. The Google Cloud Shell is a set of utilities you can download and run on any machine, but in this case, they're downloaded and run on a remote server and you're giving access to them through a web browser. It's a real Linux environment, and you're able to do a variety of tasks in it. It has support for a variety of languages, and is configured automatically for using Google Cloud with popular tools such as text editors and other tasks and other tools you'll need to complete certain tasks. Let's go ahead and click Start Cloud Shell. While it's starting up, we should note that one of the important features of this is that it maintains its state. Even if you close this web browser, come back a month later on the other side of the world, logged into your account, that state will have been preserved for you. 
As you can see, we're logged into our Cloud Shell now. We can type help to learn about commands that we can use. And as we go through the series of lectures, we will continue to use the Cloud Shell for items which may not be as easy to do in the user interface using the web browser. Some things you can only accomplish by using the command line, and we'll leverage the Cloud Shell instead of asking you to install software on your local machine. If you'd like to install software in your local machine, the exact code that runs in this Google Cloud Shell, Google Cloud Platform provides documentation that is specific to Windows, Linux, and Mac platforms on how to do this. They also describe how to authenticate and connect the software that you install on your computer to your Google Cloud account. Since Google offers a pre-maintained cloud shell that is exactly the same as the software that you would download on your machine, we won't go over that and we'll encourage you to use the cloud shell instead. Not only is it maintained and more secure, but it's a whole lot more convenient and consistent. Now that you have access to the Google Cloud dashboard and are hopefully familiar with it and have access to the Google Cloud shell, let's actually dive in to the Google Cloud platform itself. In the following lectures, we'll look at the exciting features of each major category of Google Cloud Platform services using the account that we just created.